as we've been uh, as we've been making our way and doing some thematic studies uh, of the book of Philippians, I hope some of these have been helpful for us. That to me, this is a this is a different way to study uh, the book. Usually, uh, I'm accustomed to just going from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, uh, just verse by verse study uh, of the book, and uh, that way you kind of know where you're going to be in the next in the next study uh, because well, you're just going to pick up. Uh, with, uh, with whatever verse you left off of, but this has been sort of a, a topical study uh, or a thematic study of the book, trying to pull out some of the, the themes, the ideas from this book that can help us in what we've been dealing with over these last few months. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we are gradually uh, coming out of uh, this, uh, this lockdown, this stay-at-home order kind of thing, but, but the principles that we're studying here, they still apply. And uh, the theme that we've had for this study is sticking together when we can't be together. Uh, but the reality is we need to be able to stick together even when we can be together. You know, it's just because uh, brethren are together doesn't necessarily mean that they're sticking together. Uh, you can be in the same room with somebody but not necessarily uh, be, uh, be with them or, or together with them. And so uh, these principles obviously apply uh, even as things continue to normalize around us, and uh, as we are eventually, hopefully, going to be able to be in the same room for these studies and have our worship services to where we can all be in the same worship uh, assembly together. But as we've looked at these various studies uh, through the book, we have seen that Paul enjoyed a, a special relationship uh, with this church, and obviously Paul enjoyed a special relationship with all of the congregations that he helped to establish, and uh, even ones that he didn't, like the church in Rome. Uh, he he uh, had a special bond with a number of the folks who were there. Uh, but as Paul is writing this particular letter, the book of Philippians, uh, from a Roman prison, he, he misses his brethren. And that's, that's kind of the main message, uh, one of the main messages we get from this book. is It's not just a, a letter to them to, uh, uh, to tell them how to live the Christian life without any personal uh, elements involved in it. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head how many times, but uh, this is a very personal book. Uh, and here we've got uh, personal pronouns like I and me and my and uh, those kind of things. If, if my count just rapidly looking at these uh, really quick, I think it's about 75 times or 70 to 80 times uh, that you have the personal pronoun I or me or my in this book. Uh, and so this is a very personal letter for Paul, and obviously he's writing this as he did all of the letters that we have in the New Testament. He's writing this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but it's interesting that the Holy Spirit is making this a personal letter for Paul. The Holy Spirit could have just made this uh, an impersonal letter. He, he, he couldn't have, you know, the Holy Spirit could have made it to where there were no I or my or me or anything like that in the book, but Holy Spirit uh, inspired Paul, allowed Paul. Uh, to, to, end it, to, uh, to indicate some very personal relationships with them. And so as he did this, he just talked about how much he longed to be with them. Chapter 1 and verse 8 says he longed for them with the affection of Jesus. Uh, and he just wanted to be back together with them. No doubt he wanted to be out of prison, but he wanted to be back with his brethren. Uh, and and the, these, he had a special relationship with them in the sense that uh, he, from the very first chapter, chapter 1 verse 5 through chapter 4, uh, you get down in chapter 4, verses uh, about 14 through 18, where he talked about the fact that they had been supporting him. Uh, and financial gifts had been supplied to him while he was in Philippi, and even now that he's uh, continued on uh, even to, uh, to this uh, Roman prison, uh, Epaphroditus had brought this latest gift to him. And so uh, they, they, they had been taking care of Paul. He even talked to them about the fact that when he left Philippi, back in Acts chapter 16, when he had left Philippi and he went to Thessalonica, well, they sent a gift to him while he was in Thessalonica. They, they were continued. So they, and some, some have looked at the church at Philippi and even, even considered Phil, the church at Philippi to maybe uh, be maybe Paul's uh, overseeing congregation, his sponsoring congregation, depending on what terminology you might use for that today. Uh, but in chapter 4, uh, Paul talked about the fact that no church shared in the giving and receiving the way that the church in Philippi did, that no other church did that for him. And that, that those terms, giving and receiving, uh, 
uh, in, in that text are interesting, uh, that it indicates that not only was Philippi giving uh, for Paul, but they were on the receiving end of some gifts that they turned around and gave to Paul. So that's, that's today, that's what a, uh, an overseeing or sponsoring congregation does. Uh, like when, when this congregation, when, uh, when Josh and Kara were down in uh, Paraguay, we served as, as that giving and receiving, that, that overseeing, sponsoring congregation where other congregations were sending funds here. Uh, and, uh, and then we were able to uh, collect all of those and make them available to Josh and Kara. So obviously, um, I hope this is the case, that Josh and Kara had a, had, a, had a special bond with Palm Beach Lakes that they did not necessarily have with other congregations. They had it. Uh, but there was something special about this kind of being their home congregation. And uh, uh, maybe, uh, not, not entirely, but maybe that's some of the sense in which Paul felt his close bond with the church in Philippi. Uh, obviously, the church in Antioch, uh, where he, that's kind of his home base uh, for these uh, missionary journeys. Each of his three missionary journeys were, uh, came out of Antioch of Syria. So uh, obviously, he had a special bond with them as well. But here we are. Uh, looking at this, this church that he had been talking about, how he had prayed for them and enjoyed a great fellowship with them, uh, enjoyed great unity with them and, uh, and all of the things that we've noticed to this point. But we've spent the last several weeks talking about the fact that in order to stick together uh, when we can't be together, that we've got to keep our focus on Christ and, uh, and make sure that while we are trying to help each other and, uh, and, and serve each other, that ultimately our purpose is to keep our focus on Christ and to serve Christ. Uh, you know, we, we cannot become so distracted by, uh, by taking care of each other that we lose sight of what our purpose is. Now, obviously, as we serve each other, we are serving Christ. Uh, in Matthew chapter 25, you remember the uh, closing verses of Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus depicted the judgment scene. And as he depicted the judgment scene, he said uh, he would say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he goes on to the following verses, talk about, For when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. And, and he talked about uh, how these individuals on the day of judgment had been taking care of him. And naturally, the question that's asked there, and he, Jesus suggests that the question that would be asked on the day of judgment is, Lord, when did, when did we give you food and when did we give you drink and when did we give you clothing and when did we take you in and when did we do all of those things and Jesus's response is when you did it unto the least of these my brethren well you did it to me so as we are serving each other uh, and that's one thing we have noted uh, on this particular study of keeping our focus on Christ is a matter of serving him as we are serving each other obviously we are serving Christ and th those two things uh, have got to be kept together but uh, obviously, we, we recognize that, that our identity has, has got to be found in Christ. That uh, we are not merely uh, living on this earth a, a different life than everybody else. That our identity as a bondservant, as a saint, as a called out one, is because of what Christ has done for us. We've noted the point that when we, uh, when we are serving the Lord, that we, we need to submit to Him. And Paul emphasized that throughout this letter. Uh, how uh, he was submitting himself, how Epaphroditus had submitted himself, uh, how Timothy even was one who had uh, submitted himself. And so Paul said, I, I, if, if the Lord wills, uh, here, here's what I want to happen. Submitting his will to, to, the, to the will of the, of the Father, uh, to the will of Christ, keeping that focus there. And then we've noted how Paul was gladly serving uh, the Lord and making sure that it wasn't just uh, a... a a service out of necessity or out of bondage where he was, you know, forced into servitude or anything like that. But it was something that Paul enjoyed doing. And obviously here's a letter that emphasizes that, that concept of joy and rejoicing over and over. And so that, that was the heart with which Paul was serving uh, the Lord was a heart of gladness. We've noted how uh, all motivation uh, in our service and our dedication to the Lord is our motivation is founded in Christ. We look back at what he did for us in chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. And when we think about what Jesus did for us, obviously, we think about the fact that we need to turn around and, and to serve him with just as much uh, devotion and heart as Jesus uh, gave to us. And so he's really our motivation. And then last week, we spent some time talking about the fact that uh, when I put my focus on Christ, it helps me to be a better brother in Christ. It helps me to be a better sister 
uh, in Christ. And uh, we, we noted the fact that it helps us to have a joy of just being together. Uh, and that joy comes from the fact that we share a, a, a bond in Christ. And we noted the fact that we have mutual encouragement from one another. And we see that in chapter 2 and verse 1. And we noted how, how Paul looked at Epaphroditus. And in chapter 2 and verse 29, he encouraged the church at Epaphroditus to receive him as a brother uh, and recognizing how you're supposed to see your brothers and sisters in Christ and how you're supposed to treat them. So uh, when, when I put my focus on Christ, it helps me uh, to treat my brethren better, to see who they are, uh, and, and to note that this isn't about what I think I want or what I think I need, but it's looking out for my brethren and seeing what do they want and what do they need and, and not allowing any kind of social barriers to get in the way of doing what I need to do for, for my brother. And that's why Paul said about Epaphroditus in chapter 2 and verse 25, he's my brother. Uh, here are two individuals who are of completely different backgrounds, and yet he says, he's my brother. You sent him to me. He, he's, he's the one that you sent to me to serve me. But he, he talked about how grateful he was for all that Epaphroditus had done for him and how, how uh, stressed he had, he had become when Epaphroditus had become ill uh, and how sorrowful he he was at the very thought that he could have died in service to him. Uh, and so putting our focus on Christ, it, it helps us in our service to each other. I've got one other point that I want us to see this morning uh, on this matter of being focused on Christ. But as I, was, as I was driving here today, and before we look at this last point, as I was driving here today, I thought about, you know, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about if we're going to stick together in order, to, even when we can't be together to keep that close bond, We've been talking for these last five weeks about the fact that we've got to keep our focus on Christ. And that's in these 104 verses that Paul writes to the church of Philippi, that's what he says to them. You've got to keep your focus on Christ. But I thought about the church at Philippi. When did they start having their focus on Christ? Paul's writing to them a number of years after they had become Christians, but I want us to take just a couple minutes as, as we kind of wrap up this particular focus on, on, uh, on Christ in, in the book of uh, Philippians this morning. Uh, I want you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. And uh, let me just tell you what we're doing. We're gonna, we're gonna, I want to look at just a couple things in Acts 16 just to kind of uh, bind us, uh, at least to give us a, a, a starting point for their focus on Christ. Because what he's saying is you need to maintain this. I just want to back up because I hadn't thought about this. Where did it start for them? And then we're going we're gonna to look at one other uh, sub-point here today on keeping our focus on Christ. And then there's at least, uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen next Sunday. Um, I'm not sure where we're going to be having class. I'm not sure what the nature of that class will be yet. Uh, the elders are monitoring uh, what's going on here, and we'll make a decision about next Sunday. So uh, if we continue our study of Philippians next Sunday, there, I, I've got uh, another lesson uh, that we'll look at on uh, on that, and uh, there's, there's another key word in the book of Philippians. It's found nine times uh, in the book, and I, I think it's a key word in the book. We'll look at that um, hopefully next week. But I want you to look at Acts chapter 16, because here's where it all starts. Uh, and uh, we, we may mention a little bit of this uh, if, if we have that class next week as well. But I want you to think about Paul coming to the city of Philippi. He comes to this city that, that is a city that does not know Christ. Now, think about what we've been studying these last five weeks. If we're going to stick together, we've got to keep our focus on Christ. He's about ready to meet people that they don't know Christ. And many of them don't even know God. There's not a Jewish synagogue here, and so many of them don't even know God. So he's coming to talk to people about a brand new concept. Jesus Christ. Who is this? He's going to tell them in this letter that he writes to them some years later, uh, you need to keep your focus on Christ. Well, where did that start? He, you know Acts chapter 16. He goes down to a riverside in verse 13. And, and this is only going to be good for you if you'll get your Bibles and look at this. So I, I hope you'll look in Acts chapter 16 with me. You know he goes down by the riverside to where the women are praying. And he finds verse 14, he finds Lydia there. And he begins to be able to talk to this woman named Lydia who's, She's not even from Philippi. The Bible says she's from Thyatira, but she worshiped God. She was one of a, of a, of a Jewish origin who knew the God of heaven, 
who knew the God of the Old Testament, and that's why she's there at the riverside on the Sabbath day, to pray and to worship her God. So when Paul comes to her, I want you to see what it says right after it says that she was one who worshipped God. Worship God, and then my Bible has a period. I want you to see what it has right after that in verse 14. It says, the Lord opened her heart to th heed the things spoken by Paul. Now, some people have looked at that, and, and they've thought, well, that's, that's some sort of uh, predestination. That's some sort of direct operation of the Holy Spirit, where the Lord, before, you know, before she had a chance to do anything, the Lord kind of opened her heart, and the Lord caused her uh, you know, in, in a direct way to obey Him uh, without much of her will being involved. Well, that's not, that, that's not, what, this, that's not what this means. It's when it says the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul, I want you to look over in verse 32, same chapter. And I want you to see something that happens with, with, when he's, when he's uh, with, the Philipp, with the Philippian jailer. Um, and I want you to tie these two things together. I want you to tie verse 14 and verse 32 together because it's the same thing. Um, and it's, you know, if, if, we want, if we want to have a good commentary on what does it mean that the Lord opened her heart in verse 32. And by the way, the Lord here is Christ. That's why I'm coming back to this in chapter 16. The Lord here in verse, in verse, 16, or verse 14, chapter 16, is Christ. So Christ opened her heart to heed the things that were spoken by Paul to her. This is not a direct, uh, the, without her will being involved kind of operation. How do we know that? Well, nothing is going to be different between what Paul does with this woman by the riverside and what Paul does with this jailer uh, after midnight. Well, what does chapter 2 and verse 32 say about what Paul does? Then they, Paul and Silas, spoke the words of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. Tie the two things. Do you see the words, the Lord? He spoke the word of the Lord, verse 32, to them. Well... What was happening to Lydia in verse 14? The Lord was opening her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Well, what did Paul speak to Lydia? He spoke the words of Christ. Put these two things together. As Paul, whether it's to Lydia or whether it's to the jailer, as Paul spoke about Christ to these two individuals, those words about Christ and from Christ change their lives. And those words opened their hearts. Opened her heart, verse 14. Opened his heart, verses 32 and verse 33. Those words opened their hearts to heed those things that were being spoken. Is the Lord involved in this? Of course the Lord is involved in this. It's not that Paul is, is, is speaking on his own, separate and apart from the work of the Lord. Obviously, Christ is there, you know, even in the Great Commission, when Jesus said, go and preach to all creatures, Jesus said, I will be with you. Lo, I am with you always. Uh, and so as Paul is preaching, obviously, Christ is involved in the teaching of the gospel, uh, and even perhaps even in a miraculous sense, even in that day. But what changed their lives was to hear the message of Christ, to hear what Christ had done for them. This is a brand new idea. Now, it's especially brand new for the jailer. For, the, for, the, uh, for Lydia, she should have had a concept of the coming Messiah. Uh, here's, here's a woman who's uh, there on the Sabbath day and has, has a belief in God. I don't, I don't know to what extent she knew uh, the Old Testament and the prophecies of the Old Testament, but uh, hopefully she would have known these, these prophecies about the coming Messiah. And so Paul is there to say, here's what the Old Testament says about the Messiah, and here is Jesus Christ. And, and it's one, he, he fulfilled all of these things, but for the jailer, it's a brand new concept. But it changes his life. Here's a man who, who does not know Christ, but he hears about Christ, and it changes who he is. And so what happens with, with Lydia? In verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, verse 15, she begged us saying, look at what she says. If you have judged me, listen to this, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, if you have judged me to be faithful to Christ, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. Her life was all anew. And she heard this good news about Christ, 
And she said to Paul, if you found me to be faithful to him and obeying him and doing what, the, what Christ wants me to do, would you stay here and tell me a little bit more about this Christ? So when she is asking him to come into his house, it's, it's not merely just to offer hospitality. She does that, and, and you see it again in verse 40, the last verse of this chapter. You'll see her hospitality again. But I believe that she is desirous to know even more about this Christ. That, that she's hearing about. So again, Paul's going to write this letter to the church of Philippi. He says, keep your focus on Christ. Well, where did it start? It started with a hunger and a thirst to know more about this Christ. And she was, as soon as she learned about Christ, what she obeyed. There, there was no delay in this. And then she wanted to know more about the Christ. You know that Paul stays in Philippi. And there's this, there is this girl, verse 16, calls her a certain slave girl. Uh, one who was possessed with a demon, and she was going around, and uh, she was saying in verse 17, these men are the servants of the Most High God. They proclaim to us the way of salvation. Verse 18 says she did this for many days, and Paul was greatly annoyed uh, by the fact that here is this demon uh, possessed girl who is going around and following them and saying this, but I, 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 want, I wanted to come down to what he says in verse 18. I want you to imagine that you are in Philippi. And you hear this slave girl going around and, and saying these things. And I want you to imagine that you are there in Philippi and you see and you hear Paul say this. Uh, verse 18, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. You just, you've just heard Paul call the name of Christ. And the Bible says the very same hour that demon came out. You're there in Philippi. You recognize what's happening. Perhaps here's Lydia, who's been telling others about Christ and what Christ has done for her. And now you see Paul calling on the name of Christ that cast out this demon. When Paul writes this letter later and says, keep your focus on Christ, this was not something new. This was something that they had, that they had grasped, that they had grabbed a hold of at the very beginning. And Paul says, don't you let go. So here's, here's Lydia, and Lydia is focused on, uh, on Christ. Here is Paul uh, commanding this, this demon to come out and saying, uh, do this in the name of Christ. And then look in verse 31, or look in verse 30, where uh, the jailer says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what's the answer in verse 31? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Some people look at that and think, well, that's, that's all he had to do. It was only faith only. It's nothing of, the, uh, nothing of the sort. This was brand new for this jailer. The Lord Jesus Christ? If I was the jailer, my first question would have been, who's that? Who's the Lord Jesus? Okay, I, I, I'll believe what you're saying that I need to believe on him, but who in the world are you talking about? And that's why verse 32 says that they spoke the word of Christ to him and to all who were in his house. And, Im and immediately that same hour of the night, they were baptized. They obeyed Christ because they heard about Christ. And the, the, very, the very fact that they learned what Christ had done for them and how they could have, and here's where we're going in the next 10 minutes, that where how they could have an ultimate hope in Christ it changed their lives at the very beginning of their Christian life. And so Paul writes to them, Paul writes to them some years later. Uh, how many years later? Maybe about uh, uh, 10 years later, Paul is writing to them and he says, you need to keep your focus there. You know, you know as a Christian, you can relate to Lydia, you can relate to the jailer. You become a Christian and you're on fire for Christ. You, you have learned maybe for the first time or, or maybe it's just, maybe it's something you've known, but it hits you maybe for, for real for the first time that thinking about what Christ has done for you and thinking about the hope that is laid up for you, for, for what Christ has for you. And when you become a Christian, you're on fire. But sometimes that fire, well, it, it, it just, it doesn't maintain that same fervor for some reason. And sometimes our fervor in serving the Lord 
it's, it's not as strong as it once was like in Acts 16 when we first became Christians. And so Paul writes this letter to them and he's trying to stoke that fire again. He's trying to build them up again. And he's trying to make sure that you, that you maintain your focus on Christ. We live in a world not much different. Not much different than the world that they lived in. And no doubt there were all sorts of things that would have distracted them from keeping their focus on Christ. We live in a world that, boy, there's all sorts of things that can get us off track. How can we stick together? We've got to maintain each and every day, not just the Lord's Day, not just on Sunday when we, when we gather together to worship, but every day. We've got to make sure that, that He is our number one focus. Now, come back to the book of Philippians, and, and I, want to close out, I want to close out this particular look at focusing on Christ with this last point, and that is that I, if I'm going to keep my focus on Him, I find my ultimate hope in Him. And what I wanted to do today is just take us from the beginning to the end uh, of, the, of, this, of these Christians in Philippi, that they became Christians because of Christ, that they were on fervor, on fire because of Christ. And so Paul writes to them and says, don't let that die out. Keep your hope focused on Him and, and, and what, what He has laid up for you. Heaven is talked about a lot in this book. And I just want us to see a few of those times. Look, look, look in Philippians. Look in chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Maybe, maybe one of your favorite texts in this book. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. Paul says, For our citizenship is in heaven. That's a beautiful concept. Our citizenship is not on this earth. Sure, we've got a citizenship on this earth. And, and you know that Paul even, Paul even used his Roman citizenship. And he, if you went back to Acts chapter 16 and you read the, last, the end of the chapter, you would see Paul uh, talking about his Roman citizenship and how he had been beaten as a Roman uh, citizen and how that was unlawful. He, he was a Roman citizen, but Paul's writing to the church of Philippi and says, forget Roman citizenship. What about heavenly citizenship? Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait. What are we waiting for? Here's the focus of our study. For the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Paul says to these Christians, yes, you've got an earthly citizenship, but don't let that be your focus. Right now, we're living in a nation that's torn up in some ways. Here we are as American citizens, and we are looking around perhaps at some in this nation that are not American citizens, and so we fight for the rights of certain ones, whether they're citizens or not citizens, and boy, we, we are making everything possible out of American citizenship but that doesn't matter. In the long run, in the end, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is our citizenship in heaven. And Paul says that's where our hope is. And so we, he says, we're not just waiting for, we're not just sitting back and waiting for Jesus to come. He says, that's our focus. We are eagerly waiting. He says, we are longing for it. Peter would say in 2 Peter chapter 3, we're hastening it. Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. We're ready for you to come. Paul says that's our hope, that our hope is in Christ and his return. Go back to chapter 1. In chapter 1, we see this again, and you know verse 21 says in chapter 1, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And then he talks about the fact that he's hard-pressed between those two things, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. Where's his focus? On Christ. He says, I've got a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is very far better. He longed for the day, either when Christ would return, and he says, I'm eagerly waiting for that day. But he says, you know what? If I, if I were to die before Christ returns, he says, that would be just fine too. Why? Because that's what his focus is on. His focus is not on, on, on physical death uh, and, uh, and the trauma that might surround that. His focus is on what happens after I die. And he says, after I die, it's gain. After I die, I'll get to go and be with Christ. That's his focus. He would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he longed for that day. You know, if we're going to stay focused on Christ, 
We need to think about that hope that he has laid up for us and, uh, and how much better. Think about that. And, and I think it's the New American Standard that puts the word very there, how it's very far better. It, it's, it's, not that, it's not that being in heaven is, well, sure, it's going to be better than what's here. And it's not just that being in heaven with the Lord is, is far better than what's here. There's no comparison, Paul says. It is very far better. Now, go, to, go earlier in chapter 1. Three times, three times in this book, Paul talks about the day of Christ. Look in chapter 1 and verse 6 and, and how he emphasizes the need to be ready for it, how we need to work for it. In chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident in this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, Christ, has begun a good work in you, he will complete it, Christ will complete it until what? The day of Jesus Christ. So here you are working for the Lord, and he says, don't stop working for the Lord and keep working for him all the way until the day of Christ. That's the second coming. That's the day of judgment that he's talking about. Look down at verse 10. Similar expression down in verse 10. His prayer for, him, for the church is that they might approve the things that are excellent. He says that you may be sincere and without offense, that you may be devoted and truly genuine in your service to the Lord. And look at what he says at the end of the verse. Until the day of Christ. Where's our focus? Our focus is on serving the Lord and being ready for His coming, being ready for the day of Christ. The third time that you see this expression, the day of Christ, is over in chapter 2, where Paul had talked to them about not complaining in verse 14, how he had talked to them about being a light in the midst of darkness in verse 15. And then in verse 16, he says, holding forth the word of life, so that he says, I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. What does he mean by that? He does not want these brethren to lose, to, to lose their fervor for serving the Lord. He does not want them to fall short. What the, what the Hebrews writer would talk about in Hebrews chapter 3, of falling short uh, of, of, that which, uh, of, of that perfect uh, union with Christ in heaven. Paul doesn't want them to fall short of arriving at, at their final hope and, and final place in heaven. So he says, I want you to hold forth, hold fast to that word of life so that when my race is done, it won't be in vain when the day of Christ comes and we are all together. Paul was focused not just on his time to be with the Lord and how that would be very far better. He was focused in chapter 2 and verse 16 on his brethren being with the Lord when he came back. And he said that would be the ultimate joy, not just to be there with the Lord himself, but to be there with the Lord and with his brethren as well. You know chapter 3 and verse 14, where Paul says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward God, call of God. Where is that? Where is the upward call of God? Where is that upward call of God to heaven? It's in Christ Jesus. His focus is on Christ. His focus is on that ultimate hope. And he says, that's what I'm pressing toward. I haven't arrived. I haven't attained yet, is what he says in the verses that lead up to that. He says, I'm not where I need to be, so I'm continuing to press forward in my service to the Lord so that I might have that hope of heaven, that hope of heaven that I have only in Christ. Earlier in chapter 3, look in verse uh, 10 and 11, where Paul talked about the fact that he wanted to know the power of the resurrection of Christ to be conformed to the death of Christ. Why? In verse 11 that if by any means I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul recognized that the only hope that he had of being raised from the dead was because of the resurrection of Jesus himself. We, Paul's the one who wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and focused on the resurrection in that chapter and pointed out that without, without the resurrection of Christ, we as Christians are all the men most pitiable. We have no hope at all without that. And so Paul says in chapter 3 here in the book of Philippians, I want to know the power of the resurrection of Christ. I want to, I want to be conformed to his death. I want to make sure that I am ready so that I might be raised from the dead as well, be raised with him. One final point on this in finding our ultimate hope in Christ is in chapter 4 and verse 3. In this section, he had talked about the Lord multiple times. Verse 1, stand fast in the Lord. Verse 2, uh, be of one mind in the Lord. Verse 4, rejoice 
in the Lord. Verse 5, the Lord is at hand. Verse 1, 2, 4, and 5 have the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord all throughout. It's talking about Christ in this section. And so he talks about his, his uh, fellow brethren in verse 3, those who had labored with him. And he says, whose names, the end of verse 3, whose names are in the book of life. Paul looked at these faithful Christians. These individuals, go back to Acts 16 in your mind. These individuals, Lydia, the jailer, and others, who had heard the word of Christ and had loved that and had been obedient to that and had now were serving the Lord, and he looked back perhaps at some of them. Perhaps some of them are on his mind. He mentions others like Yodia and Syntyche uh, and others here in verses 2 and 3, but perhaps he's looking back at some of them and recognizing here are these faithful Christians in Philippi, and they've got their names written in the book of life. That's all that matters. Just verses earlier is where we began. Our citizenship as Christians needs to be in heaven. That's where our name needs to be registered. It doesn't matter what nation we are citizens of on this earth. It doesn't matter what our nationality is on this earth. It doesn't matter what somebody else's nationality is on this earth. It doesn't matter whether somebody is a citizen or not a citizen, ultimately, of whatever nation, especially of America on this earth. The only thing that matters is, are we citizens of heaven? Are our names written in the book of life? Paul says, if we're going to stick together when we can't be together, we need to make sure that our brothers and sisters in Christ have their names written in the book of life. It's possible, Revelation 3 and verse 5 says, to have our names blotted out of that book. Are we doing what we can to check on each other, to encourage each other, to build each other up so that somebody does not grow discouraged, so somebody does not walk away from Christ, to take their focus off of Christ and ultimately to have their name blotted out of that book. Our ultimate hope is only in Christ. We've got to have our names written there in that book. We've got to have our citizenship in heaven. We've got to be eagerly waiting for Him to return. That has a personal focus, but we need to be looking out for each other and making sure that the rest of us are ready so that when the Lord comes again, we can all be together in heaven as God's family.